professor of law at George Mason University. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is my pleasure to testify today on the subject of the condition of small business commercial real estate lending in local markets. As noted in a recent study by former Federal Reserve economist Thomas Durkin, and as he reminds us, many independent entrepreneurial businesses rely on what is conventionally known as consumer credit in starting and building their businesses, things like credit cards, home equity loans, and even auto title loans. Uh, these sources of credit are especially important for women and minorities who tend to be excluded from traditional small business lending markets. As a result, a lot of regulations that seem to be ostensibly aimed at consumer lending will also tend to disrupt effectively small business lending as well. Pr prudent, well-designed government regulation of consumer and small business lending can certainly promote competition, expand consumer choice, lead to lower prices and overall productive lending. Things like the original Truth in Lending Act, as it was originally conceived before it got lay larded up with a lot of uh, amounts of regulation and litigation, provides a good example. But well-intentioned lending regulations may also have a large number of unintended consequences as well. And most relevant to this hearing, one of those unintended consequences is the curtailment of lending, especially to consumers and small entrepreneurial businesses. Um, unintended consequences are most likely and most severe when legislation or regulation goes beyond the modest goals of improving the market process, but instead supplants individual choice and competition through the substantive regulation of particular terms of credit contracts. It's basic economics that in order to make an economically prudent loan, a bank has two considerations. First, it must be able to estimate the risk of the loan and price the loan accordingly. Regulations that either increase the risk of lending or make it more difficult to accurately price risk will make this task more difficult and expensive. Second, if the bank is unable to accurately price the loan, it will have to reduce its risk exposure. It can do this either by limiting the number of loans it makes, limiting those to whom it will lend, lending, lending for instance, only to lower risk borrowers, or by reducing the amount it lends, such as by reducing the size of loans made or credit lines on credit cards. Provisions in recent legislation that's been enacted, such as the Credit Card Act, has made it more difficult for credit card issuers to price risk efficiently. The consequences of something like the Credit Card Act have been predictable, and in fact, I predicted them. Credit card issuers have tried to adjust other terms of credit card agreements in order to try to continue pricing risk efficiently, and to the extent they have been unable to do so, they have acted to reduce their risk exposure by offering fewer loans, lending to fewer people, and reducing borrowers' credit lines. If enacted, proposed legislation such as the proposal for a national interest rate ceiling on credit cards of 6%, the proposed Consumer Financial Protection Agency, and the proposal to permit cram down of home mortgages would further exacerbate this credit crunch by further increasing the risk of lending, making it more difficult to price risk, and as a result, redu uh, resulting in a greater curtailment of, uh, of, of lending. Let's talk about the Credit Card Act for a moment. The Credit Card Act had some modestly decent uh, proposals in it that uh, may have even helped consumers a, a little bit. Um, on the other hand, there were other provisions of the law that interfered with accurate risk-based pricing, such as new limitations on interest rate uh, uh, adjustments, uh, default provisions, and that sort of thing. The market response to the Card Act illustrates how regulation can disrupt lending markets by interfering with uh, um, efficient risk-based pricing. Consider just a few of the terms of a credit card. Interest rates, penalty interest rates, annual fees, length of grace payments, the amount of circumstances under which behavior-based fees will be assessed, degree of acceptance by merchants. I could go on, but I've only got five minutes. I'd estimate, what, 60, 70, 80 terms are potential for a, uh, for a credit card. The CARD Act placed political limitations on the ability of lenders and borrowers to establish these terms through free market processes in order to try to price risk accurately and to offset declining revenues from newly regulated credit card terms, credit card issuers have repriced other terms of credit card agreements. As a result, borrowers have seen newer increased annual fees, fixed rate, intre fixed rate interest cards have been converted to variable rate cards. Frequent flyer and other rewards cards have become stingier, and other fees, such as cash advance fees, have risen. Most notably, some provisions of the Card Act make it more difficult for card issuers to raise rates on consumers based on risk and changes in economic uh, uh, circumstances. Again, the market response has been entirely predictable. Credit card issuers have had to raise interest rates on all cardholders in order to guard against the risk that they might need to raise rates later, but might be able to, unable to do so 
as a result of, uh, of uh, regulation. Most relevant for this hearing, there has been widespread reports that as a result of the CARD Act, credit card issuers have slashed credit lines and canceled credit cards. Well, this uh, reflects many different factors. In part, it reflects the effect of the CARD Act. Thank you.